Hi, welcome to this talk, and um, thanks for joining me as we give a very high-level overview of some considerations around designing secure devices and how to use TFM and, uh, and Zephyr can hopefully make that daunting process a bit easier for you. Uh, my name is Kevin Townsend, um, and I'm an engineer at Lenaro working in the light team, which mainly specialize in small embedded, embedded devices and IoT devices, including some security concerns. Um, this talk won't go into exhaustive detail since we have a limited amount of time, obviously. Uh, I don't want to bore anybody more than that's strictly necessary. But uh, it will hopefully lay down some signposts that you can follow, uh, that you can follow up online with some of the great communities that exist around these open source platforms that we're going to talk about today and some of the tools we'll discuss. So, um, what is TFM? What is Zephyr? Uh, maybe you're familiar with some of these projects, maybe not. Um, so TFM essentially provides a, basically an essential foundation for secure IoT development. Security is obviously a fast-moving niche field requiring up-to-date and, and expert information, and it's really difficult um, to recruit people in that area. And it's also difficult to make sure that you're always up-to-date on, on the current state of affairs around embedded and IoT security. So TFM is designed and maintained by security experts, and it helps address this common skills gap um, by implementing best practices around cryptography, secure storage, device attestation, trusted boots, etc. Basically, it gives you an excellent starting point to designing a secure device without having to be an expert in which cryptographic algorithms to use, which key sizes to use, which ones are vulnerable or not to, to, to attacks relative to the resources that you have on embedded systems? How do you encrypt and verify firmware images? How do you securely store data and secret information on, your, uh, on, your, on the flash on your devices? How do you verify device identity, etc.? These are all very sort of niche problems that need to be solved well, or you have a false sense of security, and TFM really does a good job of sort of putting those, those building blocks and that, that basic foundation in place for you. Um, something else we'll be talking about is, uh, is Zephyr RTOS. Now, Zephyr uh, is a real-time OS for embedded and IoT devices. It has an enormous amount of momentum behind it from some of the most important companies in, in the embedded space today. Um, it's cross-vendor and cross-architecture, which I think is important. It's not tied to one specific vendor. It's not tied to one specific uh, block of IP. It, it has a very broad adoption in, in the embedded community. It's mature, it's regularly tested and reviewed by domain experts, including security experts, and it has excellent cross-platform tooling and, and support and, and, a, and a very robust uh, community around it. And of course, uh, also fully open source with an Apache 2.0 license. Um, TFM has been integrated into Zephyr since the 2.3 release with ongoing changes in the current 2.4 uh, cycle and obviously some, some, some changes that are planned for 2.5. Something I think that's worth highlighting is you can optionally use QEMU with Zephyr, including emulation for, TA, uh, for TFM based on the MPS2 AN521 platform, which uses an ARM Cortex-M33. Now, the reason this is important is that this fa the fact that you can use QEMU with Zephyr and with TFM means you can actually run some of the tests and some of the software that we'll discuss in this tutorial with no hardware required. So you can download these repositories and, and, and sort of get started uh, developing and even a bit of debugging um, just using emulation. So it's a, there's a very low barrier to entry just to test out some of these, uh, these packages and libraries and projects. So next. So this simple illustration here shows how TFM and, and Zephyr basically fit together. Um, at the start of the whole process, uh, you can see this diagram on the right-hand side here. At the start of the whole process um, is the requirement basically for secure boot. Um, we'll go into that in more detail later, but a secure boot process is the cornerstone of designing a secure system since you need to be able to, to trust the code you're running before it even starts to execute. If you don't have a secure boot system, you, you, you basically don't have security. So the bootloader, um, which you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of the diagram there, that's sort of the first thing that will start up in your code usually. And the first thing it will do is it will verify that the firmware image hasn't been tampered with 
Um, it, it, and we'll, we'll go into some of the details of how that happens in, in some of the upcoming slides, but it verifies that the firmware is intact, that it comes from a, a reliable source, that it hasn't been tampered with. And once those conditions are met, it will then hand execution over to something called the secure processing environment, which is the firmware image we generate with TFM. This implements the secure services and device in initialization will first happen here. Once the TFM secure environment, uh, which you can see on the, on the right hand side in orange, has been initialized, execution is then handed off to the non-secure uh, processing environment, which is where we use the Zephyr RTOS. For anything security related, um, calls are made between the non-secure Zephyr image and the secure TFM image through a shared memory space that's usually managed in hardware on ARM V8M um, cores like the M33 using trust zone, ARM trust zone uh, features. We'll analyze some of this in more detail uh, in, in this talk, of course. So, um, so what does a secure device really mean, though? It's an extremely broad term, obviously, and security covers an enormous field of research and, and a lot of practical considerations. It, it's, it's sort of a vague term. So for the purpose of this talk, uh, we'll discuss the following four elements that I consider essential to take into account when designing a developing or developing a secure um, IoT product. As mentioned previously, a secure boot is the cornerstone of a secure device. You must be able to trust the firmware your device is running but also be able to securely and reliably keep it up to date as new vulnerabilities and security considerations uh, or just feature additions come into play. Trusted execution is a popular topic in recent years, both in the Cortex-A and more recently in the Cortex-M space with the introduction of ARMVM and ARM Trust Zone. What this means is essentially isolating code execution into trusted and untrusted environments to minimize the attack surface of untrusted, uh, uh, that untrusted code has access to. By limiting the access to device secrets, it's easier to mitigate the risk of future attacks, which is the idea of trusted execution. And we'll look at that, we'll look at that in more detail also. Embedded and IoT devices are generally all about data and connectivity. Uh, so we need to think about how to secure and authenticate data coming off of devices and how it's transmitted. Both TFM and Zephyr have a lot to offer here, in my opinion, um, and are, are, are good choices in terms of ensuring reliable connectivity and, and data transmission. Provisioning is another very wide term that will mean different things to different people, depending on your perspective. But we also need to think about how devices are provisioned in the factory, for example, getting security devices onto keys, registering them in a, in, in a central database, etc and how they are provisioned in the field, often referred to as late binding, uh, such as binding a device to a cloud service. We'll briefly talk about some of the work being done at Lenaro to explore some of these problems and, and see what solutions we're able to propose. So secure, let's start with the secure boot then. So secure boot, um, TFM and Zephyr, both make use of an excellent open source project called MCU Boot. Uh, it originally started as part of the Apache Minute RTOS, but it's been widely adopted by a number of projects and RTOS is, um, since, since its debut in, in Minute. In many cases, it's used as a second stage bootloader when a hardware bootloader is present, but it can also be used just as a primary bootloader uh, if, if you don't have a hardware or, or primary option. It supports a variety uh, firmware update schemes. Uh, the default is generally to use two identically sized flash partitions in internal flash memory, where half of the flash memory is used to hold an update image, um, and one half is used to hold the active firmware image. And when the update image is, uh, the update image is then verified during the update process before switching from the old image to the new one to make sure, for example, that the, the signature is valid, um, and, and that the, the version numbers all, all line up, et cetera. And there's, there's a number of checks that happen there. There are also options, of course, for storing updates on external flash for single flash bank updates, et cetera. But you can look at uh, the MCU Blue web, website to get some of the, the ideas of the, the or get, to get sort of an overview of some of the pros and cons of the various approaches um, that are available for uh, firmware updates. Um, importantly, 
MCU group supports a handful of modern crypto cryptographic uh, algorithms to both verify firmware and encrypt or decrypt uh, uh, firmware images, which we'll see in more detail in the, the next slides. Um, so you can see here some requirements that, that we've identified as essential in, in any sort of secure boot system. Um, so images must be hashed and signed to ensure image fidelity and provenance. The verification of image integrity at startup is obviously an essential requirement to make sure the images haven't been tampered with between boots. Um, you need to support, of course, image encryption for images that are stored on external flash or when releasing, when releasing flash into the wild or publishing it on, on, on public servers. Um, ideally, you want to have application downgrade protection, which means uh, if there's a known issue in an older firmware release, people with the malicious intent can't intentionally go back to, to firmware with known vulnerabilities. Um, you need to have various mechanisms to enable updates of firmware in the field, and that will, of course, depend on your device, but you need a flexible approach for field-based updates. And obviously, graceful recovery from update or verification um, failures. So in, in terms of how MCU boot meets these requirements, uh, we can see the following technical details in, in case of MCU boot as of uh, the, the current release. So for hashing and signing, generally MCU boot will use a SHA-256 hash with ECDSA P256, RSA 2K or 3K, or ED25519 signatures. Um, for verifying the image integrity, of the image hash and signature are both verified at boot and during firmware updates. Um, for image encryption, you can optionally encrypt uh, firmware images with AES CTR128 with keys using one of the, the, the algorithms listed here. Uh, in terms of preventing down, uh, sort of downgrade prevention, the default mechanism is to use a software version number that is baked into the, into the firmware images. Optionally, you can also use hardware security rollback protection if that's available in your, in your chip or in your SOC. Uh, in terms of field updates, MCU but has an extensible image transport, basically, and out of the box, it was the case of Zephyr and TFM. Uh, Zephyr will support firmware updates over serial, over BLE, or just IP socket connections, and this is extensible to other transports, depending on your requirements. So I think that is an important consideration that the, trans the, the image transport is extensible. Uh, and in terms of graceful recovery from update and verification failure, the default option of using dual, in the case of the default option of using dual flashbacks. Um, when an up update tries to occur, if the image is rejected because maybe the signature doesn't match or the, the, the transfer was interrupted, obviously the dual bank flash allows you to roll back or to, rather to, to remain on, on the previous valid image until uh, a, new, a new valid image can, can be found. Um, so next is uh, trusted execution. So trusted execution is something that has seen a lot of success in, in the Cortex-A world. Uh, trusted firmware act actually has its origins more in, in the Cortex-A, and, and many of the benefits found there have trickled down to smaller embedded to the smaller embedded space in recent years with ARM Cortex-M and ARM Trust Zone. And it, it's a bit hard to summarize um, ARM Trust Zone and trusted execution and some of the ARM V8M hardware options in, in, in a single slide, but hopefully I can sort of give you a, a summary of what it is if you're not familiar with it. Basically, trusted execution on the ARM V8M is, is hardware-based isolation of the secure and non-secure processing environments via ARM, ARM V8 Trust Zone. So image exec execution will start in the secure state uh, to configure the device. And once the device has been configured, it will hand execution off to a, the non-secure region or a non-secure image, perhaps, with reduced privileges. Uh, non-secure code can obviously make calls back to the secure side via some, something called the veneer functions, which are in a shared memory space, which you can, you can look up some details on Trust Zone to see exactly how that, that's implemented. Uh, um, sort of bridging the, the, these two ex, uh, execution environments. Now, security keys and all of your device secrets and any sensitive information, of course, exists uh, and, are, and is accessible exclusively in the secure processing environment. 
So all cryptographic operations, for example, will take place in strict isolation from the non-secure memory. Uh, something that may or may not be useful to keep in mind is, is that um, both secure and non-secure images, if you have two separate flash, flash images, one for each operating environment, the, in the case of Zephyr with uh, MCU boots and TFM, the two images can be signed individually. And the benefit here is that maybe you want to separate the non-secure application development that is perhaps from an untrusted source from the secure core, which might happen in a different team or in a different lab or with a different company, or maybe if you're dealing with an OEM provider, you want to provide the secure firmware and the OEM providers are implementing the non-secure application. TFM and, and, and Zephyr and MCU would all allow you to sign the secure and non-secure images um, with separate keys. Um, so you, you can sort of decouple the, the the, the, the secret information, even from the non-secure non application developers. Um, something else to keep in mind is that it, it's not just about calling secure functions. Entire peripherals can be restricted to one processing environment. Say, for example, there, there are some hardware devices that you only want to be able to control from the secure processing environment or a specific GPIO pin. You can limit access to that peripheral or to that pin only to one or the other uh, operating environment. So in terms of how this is, is actually implemented in the real world, um, you can see here the three projects, MCU Boot, uh, Zephyr, and TFM, and the three resulting firmware images that will be flashed to, to the device. So the three binaries that are produced, you can see here, are MC, the MCU Boot.hex or ELF or whatever. And that will contain the public keys for TFM secure image and the Zephyr image because it needs to verify both of those. So those images are signed with a private key that only the developers have access to, and the public key will be written into MCU boot used to verify the signature of, of both of those images at startup. Assuming that validation passes and uh, the, the, the hash um, hasn't been tampered with, et cetera, or the signature hasn't been tampered with, um, the TFMS and the Zephyr hex files um, will, will start to execute. So the process will be, we start with MCU boot and we go to the TFM image, secure init, and then that will call the Zephyr non-secure init. But you can see how these three projects are built separately and these three hex files sort of come together to make one uh, coherent system. And veneer functions, as mentioned, are the only bridge between the S and the, 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 the NS world. So data and connectivity. Um, Securing and verifying data integrity is, is essential in any application today. We can't just assume data is reliable, uh, but it often needs to be demonstrated that it hasn't been tampered with and, and comes from a reliable source. So message authentication is a common problem with many solutions available. But one of the most common is to take a message and generate, um, as you can see in the slide here, a digest, which is essentially a short hash of the message contents and a signature, which indicates that this message or digest comes from a known source in possession of a specific private key that we can verify. Um, so basically TFM's uh, cryptography service allows us to very easily hash and sign payloads. For example, sensor data can be hashed and signed so that we can verify not only that the, the data hasn't been tampered with as it came off the device because of the, the, the digest, but we can also sign it with a, a private key where on an external device, we have the, the corresponding public key to verify also that, the, that, that, that this, this payload actually comes from a source that we trust and know based on this, this public and private key. And this is all very easy to do with, it's, it's a handful of lines of code with, with, with TFM compared to the solu solutions of trying to implement this yourself. So this is, the benefit of this approach is that it, it, it allows you to know that the message hasn't been tampered with and, and that, it, as I said, it comes from a reliable source thanks to the signature. And various Mac configurations are supported by, by TFM. Um, the main one being ECDSA, which combines SHA-256 hashes, which are the same ones that, that are used in Git, for example. You might be familiar with those sort of long uh, hexadecimal strings that, that, that identify commits. That's, that's a, a SHA-256 hash and ECDSA uh, P256 uh, signatures.
So aside from trusting the data hasn't been tampered with and that the data comes from a reliable or a known source, we often also need to hide the data contents entirely. That's where encryption comes into play. TFN makes use of the PSA crypto API based on Embed Crypto and Embed TLS to provide a very rich, well-tested and embedded friendly suite of encryption algorithms and tools. And embedded friendly is important because we often have to deal with very significant resource constraints in the embedded sphere. So specifically, it supports some of the most important modern algorithms like elliptic curve, AES, and, and RSA. For secure communication, Zephyr and TFM can, of course, also make use of TLS for secure transmission of, of packets and payloads uh, to cloud services or internal servers, etc. Private keys are all held exclusively in uh, secure memory and are only uh, accessible from the NS side via a key handle. So normally the key, the private keys will never be exposed to, to the NS, to the non-secure process and environment. Encryption and decryption operations are often also only a handful of lines of code, meaning the implementation details are, are largely handled transparently for you by this, the, the, the crypto service on TFM, making things like this relatively easy to implement and having a high degree of confidence in the implementation, which you often don't have. Uh, trying to spin the, 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 these kind of solutions up yourself if you're not an expert in the domain. So next is uh, provisioning. So provisioning is one of those things that will mean different things to different people. It's, it's also one of those complicated problems that always seems to get kicked down the road when people start thinking about how to implement or, or design IoT devices in the real world. <clears throat> they, they sort of defer this complex problem. What that usually means is that you run into a brick wall as soon as you start thinking about moving from a prototype to a, a product that can actually be deployed. If you care about data and devices being reliable and secure in any way, and presumably you do if you're listening to this talk. So you should be thinking about provisioning early on to keep in mind some of the technical requirements um, as early as you can in, in the development process, just to avoid running into that, that brick wall of reality when you actually have to start to deal with more than three devices on, on a development machine on, on just your desk. So, um, they have some technical overlap, but generally there are two parts of the provisioning problem, depending on where the device is in the product life cycle. You have factory provisioning, um, which is where, say, the device just came off the pick and place machine and um, devices are sitting on a, on, on a test bed, maybe, or they've come off the test bed and they need to be loaded with firm, default firmware in the factory. Maybe some specific public or private keys and default values need to be written onto the device. Um, and you don't want that information to leave the factory, so it has to happen there. And devices might be registered with a serial number, a unique user ID, a customer ID, something like that. That information will probably be logged in the system to verify the, the provenance of devices in, in, in the future based on a serial or unique ID if necessary. The other thing that comes, that, that, that comes into play with the term provisioning is something that's usually called late binding, which is, say, the device has gone out of the factory, and it's, it's, it's in a customer's hands. And now the device needs to be, has been deployed in the field and it needs to be bound, for example, to a cloud service or an internal data, data aggregation service. And maybe new private keys need to be generated on the device or certificate signing requests sent out or certificate chains stored on the device, et cetera. So those are the two issues that we generally have to deal with when we talk about provisioning and things you should keep in mind. So a sample workflow in the factory or in the field might look like this, with the provisioning app in the middle being different depending on whether it's a factory or field-based field, field -based provisioning. So you can see in the middle here, you, you have, or sorry, you have your embedded device, um, you have your provisioning application, which might just be a Raspberry Pi connected to serial to your, to your hardware to, to do factory provisioning, or it might be a, a mobile application that talks over VLE to your embedded device to do to do some um, some field provisioning and you'll probably have something like a certificate authority or some sort of similar service that basically you communicate with to actually provision and register devices in, in a database and so a, sim a simple workflow might be that you fire up your provisioning application that will send maybe a key gen request to your embedded device your embedded device in the secure processing environment, it will maybe generate a new private key and store that in persistent storage safely and generate, say, a certificate signing request. That signing request might be forwarded to the intermediary application and it will be forwarded on maybe to the certificate authority where 
the certificate authority will have the chance to say register this device and register some information about the device, some attestation info, some unique serial numbers, the date and time that the device was registered, who the customers were, etc. And it will sign and register a certificate with a unique device ID and then send that back to the intermediary app and send that back to the embedded device. And at that point, your device is provisioned. And in a sense, it can, it can use this signed certificate chain that has gone through the certificate authority back, authority back to the embedded device to verify its identity. And that gives you the opportunity to sort of register your, your, your device in some sort of uh, management system. So, which brings us to, um, to Lenaro CA. There, there are a handful of solutions out there for provisioning, and, and it's a big, complicated problem with a lot of solutions such as, uh, say, SDO is, is, is one that's, that's been gaining some traction. Um, originally from Intel, I believe, ARM has gotten involved with it, and I think trusted firmware. But there's, there's a lot of solutions out there. But it's not something with a one-size-fits-all approach. Not everyone can work with external cloud providers, for example. And the certificate signing and device registration process may need to happen purely within a company firewall, so cloud, cloud solutions are out of the question. So to try to better understand how a minimal CA and device registration process might work and what problems we run into, we've been working on a very simple proof of concept uh, CA and device registration tool written in Go that we're using to test TFM and Zephyr, et cetera. It's still a work in progress, but we think it's an important and neglected problem that really needs more explore, exploration. Um, and you can, you can have a look at some of the, some of the bullet points here of how this, how this works at present. Um, we're using a REST API and HTTPS for basically that intermediary device to, to, to act as a bridge between the embedded hardware and um, the, 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 the CA, and there's a database that will log the devices, et cetera. And we're just basically trying to see what, what can we do for, about this provisioning problem. Uh, and we're trying to do that in the open and, and see sort of what feedback, feedback we can get. So if you're interested in the provisioning problem, um, have, have a look at this, uh, sort of, at this project and we'll, we'll see the link at the end end of it. So um, in terms of a demo, if you want to see how some of this works in the real world, you can have a look today at the TFM samples, sample applications that are in Zephyr, just in the master branch as of 2.3. Um, they should all run in QEMU, so no hardware required. That's nice. Uh, the commands above should help you get started with some sample output, which you can see on the, on, on the right. Well, maybe you can't see. It's a small screenshot. but. Um, so these samples are currently being extended and, and improved, and we hope to have an example usage, uh, an example using Lenaro CA uh, available quite soon. So, um, so this this is all very rushed and 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 high level, alas. But if you see something that interests you, these links should help you find more information. And feel free to reach out to the community with TFM, Zephyr, and MCU Boot. They all have great developer communities, very competent people around them, and, and a very open, receptive community. So if you want to get involved, if any of this interests you, please have a look at some of these, uh, um, some of these links and, and some of these great communities that are working on open source software to really make secure development easier, more reliable, and, and solve some of this sort of expert domain knowledge problem that exists uh, with security today. So thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, of course, feel free to reach out to us in, in Zephyr or TFM or, or on, on the Slack channel or um, yeah, in, in whatever other means you find to get in touch with us. Thanks for your time. And uh, I, I hope this was useful.